Demonstrations in cities across Iran, the biggest in nearly a decade. Protesters say prices are too high and the government's corrupt. In 2009, unrest was met with a military crackdown. So how will the government deal with the people's anger today? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahl Barra. Death or freedom? It's a chant that was heard around Iran this week. Protesters are angry at the high cost of basic goods. The price of eggs, for example, has gone up 40% in just six months. Some Iranians say it's time for the government to focus on domestic issues and to forget Syria and forget Palestine. These protesters hope the Iran nuclear deal in 2015 would ease their financial struggles. Most international sanctions were lifted, but life for many Iranians has not improved. Government critics say the economic benefits of the deal haven't been passed on because of mismanagement and alleged corruption. And that the budget announced this month cuts vital social welfare programs while giving more money to religious and revolutionary institutions. More than 50 arrests were reportedly made in Iran's second largest city, Mashhad, with the government saying the demonstrations were uncalled for and Iran's vice president saying the protests could do more harm than good. All economic indications in the country are good. Yes, there is an increase in the prices of some products and the government is working on fixing the causes of the high prices. Some of the events that have taken place in recent days are said to have been because of the economy. But there are other reasons. The people behind what is taking place think they will be able to harm the government. But when social movements and protests start in the street, those who have ignited them are not always able to control them. Ishaq Jahangiri says the economic indicators are good, but not everyone agrees. Youth unemployment stands at more than 40 percent. And in the wider population, the number out of work has grown this year to more than 12 percent. China has been investing billions of dollars in roads and trains in Iran. But foreign investment from the West and most international banks is stalled because of U.S. sanctions. And inflation has grown significantly this year. Let's go to our guests. Joining us here in Doha, Ali Fathallah Nijad is visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. In Tehran, Gamba Nadir is a political analyst and journalist for Kehan International. And from Munich by Skype is Afshin Shahi, senior lecturer in Middle East politics at the University of Bradford. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Mr. Nijad, let me ask you this. The protests that we've seen in Iran, are they a genuine outcry over bad economy, deteriorating living standards, or this is something which is politically motivated? I think it's obviously both. If you look at uh, the real grievances in Iran, as well as to the slogans that were chanted all across the country, what has been missed by many uh, Iran observers during the last few years is that the Rouhani's economic policies have been a failure. Because although we had experienced uh, ec um, uh, GDP growth, this GDP growth has not been exclusive, inclusive. So basically what uh, economists have found out that during the past few years, both poverty and income inequality have risen. So basically the um, promises that Rouhani gave in terms of the revitalization of uh, trade with the outside world being trickling down to the normal Iranians has not materialized. Mm -hmm. So very early on, we've seen a lot of frustration uh, uh, from uh, the lower and middle strata of society vis-a-vis -vis those failed economic policies. And so there was a simmering uh, below the surface, simmering discontent below, below the surface that is now going, uh, you know, that, that is emerging. On the other hand, when it comes to political repression, also things have not uh, improved. So basically, there are both socioeconomic and political okay. grievances. Let me go to Mr. Uh, Nadiri in uh, Tehran. Mr. Nadiri, it's a movement which is building up momentum now across Iran. People saying enough is enough. But what we've seen is that a government in, so, in some sort of denial about what's happening, saying these are just a bunch of people trying to destabilize Iran. Well, you are absolutely spot on. I think the government actually 
prefers to look the other way because they promised to, to fix the economy, the Saudi state of affairs in the country by signing a nuclear deal with, with the P5 plus one group of nations. We waited four years for that. And after that, when they signed it, they said that we're going to fix it, the economy in, in 100 days and didn't happen. Uh, actually, we have this problem of runaway prices for the past 37 years or so. So it, 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 this is an economic malaise that refuses to go away for the simple fact that we never had a powerful and, 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 uh, and a strong uh, economic team in any of our uh, current or previous governments. Uh, the, the current government's uh, economic team is rubbish. They don't know how to handle the economy. They don't know how to, to take advantage of this new opening uh, uh, up to the, to the world economy. And, and they just keep looking at each other. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we, have to, uh, we should also not forget the fact that these people are, are businessmen. They only think about themselves. They funded, they sponsored uh, President Rouhani to win the election, uh, the, 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 both elections. They spent millions of dollars, and now they want something in return. So they get you know, roles and, and, and positions in his cabinet, in many other areas of the, of the government, and all they think about is their own uh, okay. you know, interests and those around them. That's why people are paying the price, because nobody thinks and cares, cares about right. the people. That's why you, 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 I, I think you are right to say that the government is in denial. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shahi, uh, Vice President uh, Ishaq Jahangiri seems to be blaming ultra conservatives particularly in Meshhad for fermenting trouble and you know as we know that Meshhad is home to some of the most prominent conservatives some of them are vocal critics of Rouhani to what extent uh, Zahangiri is very accurate about this so this is something which has been triggered by the conservatives um, it is uh, extremely difficult to determine exactly what happened uh, in the Mashhad uh, on, on Thursday. Uh, but only a few hours after the beginning of uh, the protest, we started to see kind of Iranian political factionalism uh, in every uh, sense of the term. Uh, the supporters of the government uh, and people who were from the government, like uh, uh, Mr. Jahangiri, blamed the other faction and blamed uh, basically the conservative segment of the Iranian political establishment to kind of orchestrate the protests in order to undermine uh, the government. Uh, and at the same time, uh, kind of uh, the Iranian government tried to uh, kind of uh, uh, blame kind of Iranian political factionalism primarily for the, 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 the level of instability that we see uh, in the country uh, at the moment. But just like going back to the point which was raised uh, by uh, your guest uh, from Tehran, uh, he blamed uh, the government of uh, Mr. Rouhani for the current uh, economic uh, failure. Without any doubt, if we want to look at kind of the situation uh, with a level of uh, fairness, of course, uh, the last few years has been extremely difficult for Iranian economy. But to be frank and to be fair, there is a limit to what the government of President Rouhani uh, can do. According to some estimates, uh, between 50 to 60 percent of the Iranian economy is controlled by IRGC. And this is an area that President Rouhani cannot control. According to uh, Transparency International, Iran ranked as 131 mm -hmm. out of 176. Still. Basically, Iran is considered as one of the most corrupt countries uh, in, in the region and in the world. And a lot of these problems are structural. A lot of these problems okay. are beyond the ability and the jurisdiction of uh, President okay. Rouhani. Let's talk about some of these uh, uh, problems in detail. Mr. Najad, there is unemployment, which is on the rise. Inflation is a huge problem. The general sentiment among people is that the benefits of any deal, particularly the 2015 deal, is not trickling down to us. Has Rouhani failed to deliver on the promises he made uh, for his own people? So basically what uh, we have to be aware of, that blame has to be put on both the government and the hard hardliners who control the bulk of Iran's state institutions, mm -hmm. as was alluded, alluded to. Basically what uh, Shahi was saying. Exactly. So um, the problem with Mr. Rouhani's economic policies is they have been neoliberal. So they have not been really uh, wanting to address the social question that is quite huge in Iran. You, you have uh, almost half of the Iranian population that lives around the poverty line. So, and this has been not within uh, the interest uh, of the Rouhani government to tackle with. 
Uh, on the other hand, we have the right-wing uh, conservatives and populists who pretend to be caring about uh, poorer Iranians' lives, but in, in, uh, in reality, when they assume uh, you know, powerful positions, uh, they do not engage in the distribution of wealth that would be beneficial to larger sections of society. So basically, both sides are to blame for this uh, problem, for this uh, socioeconomic malaise that mm -hmm. Iran is finding itself. And also the chance for many of the protesters reflects this dual this criticism vis-a-vis -vis all mm -hmm. uh, factions uh, of the Iranian regime. Mr. N Mr. Nadiri, I mean, uh, you've listened to what Mr. Najad and Shahi were basically saying. You cannot fairly lay the blame just on the Rouhani because uh, an important chunk of the economy has historically been under the control of the conservatives in Iran, and therefore they use it sometimes for political reasons to undermine their own opponents. So what do you respond to that? Well, the government has been very smart and successful in, in, in putting the, you know, in blaming others for what is going on in this country, politically, economically, socially, you name it, whatever it is. Uh, the IRGC, it is true that it is in charge of the uh, construction projects of this country, but they don't have access to, to US dollars. Which is it Iran's is the central bank that is God. directly controlled by the government, mm -hmm. by the government that is, uh, you know, th that is in charge of, you know, uh, balancing the, the value of national currency against U.S. dollar, which, by the way, has been, has gone through the roof over the past six years or so. So that is just one of the things that we, we should keep in mind. But, but the blame game here, you know, blaming this and that or arresting this protester or that pro protester is not going to fix our country. I think we have to start asking the government to kick out some of those in competent cabinet members that don't know what to do. They are just there, as I said, because of their money. They don't have any expertise. They, are only, they only have political affiliations and financial affiliations to those uh, interest groups around them, and they don't give a damn about <laughs> people. Let's not blame the IRGC or the, the hardliners. The hardliners don't have a lot of power anymore. They don't have even budget because the government doesn't have enough money to pay them. How can so you say... If the people are out there, they have every right to come How can you say... Because, because Mr. they are under Nadiri, how can Hardship. you say they don't have power when every single commentator of the Iranian political life knows that they have absolutely the ultimate say over politics in Iran? The, the problem is not IRGC or the hardliners. The problem is those who are taking advantage of the chaos that we are now in, using, you know, U.S. sanctions to, 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 to smuggle goods into the country, to, to, to steal and smuggle oil and gas or whatever else is outside the country. What, many things there is going on here. I, I think this is a huge mafia. They are all together. They are using this. They are politicizing everything in order to make money. And they okay. don't give a damn about people. Yeah, As I said, that people have every right to yeah. protest against runaway prices, okay. against unemployment, and, and, and the fact that point. we don't produce anything anymore. And the government has to take responsibility before things get out okay. of hand. So okay. I can jump here. Yeah, please, please, I think go ahead. we have a fundamental problem when it comes to discussing Iranian politics. The issue of factionalism is quite overblown. So, uh, you know, we tend to think of Iran uh, of having, you know, different factions of uh, the elite, mm. one being uh, the reformists or the centrists that are now seem to be uh, in, in power. On the other hand, we see the right wing conservatives and populists. But in reality, both factions are in the same boat and they are for the survival of the Islamic Republic as a system. So they have more common ground than differences. And a prime example of this is, uh, are the budgets of President Rouhani, because they give also a lot of money to uh, his so-called opponents. Uh, so, for example, the IRGC has seen you know, massive increase in, uh, in, in, in funds. And also other uh, so-called religious foundations are, have also benefited from the budgeteering of, of, of uh, President Rouhani. So all this talk of factionalism is quite overblown. And at the end of the day, all factions sit in the same boat. And this boat is called okay. regime survival. It's been quite interesting. Let me now go to Mr. Shahi, that during the protest, people were saying, stop interfering into the affairs of other countries. We don't care about Yemen, Syria or Palestine. You should care more about us here in Iran. How significant is this discontent, this outcry from the average Iranians? It is uh, very uh, significant and uh, symbolic uh, at the same time. But what we heard uh, yesterday uh, and today is not anything new. More or less, uh, we heard um, similar slogans uh, in, the, in 2009. Uh, 
uh, no to Gaza, no to Lebanon, no to intervention here and there in the Middle East. So please, more attention uh, to what is happening uh, at home. So despite the fact that, of course, we haven't heard uh, anything like this, at least in a major public demonstration since 2009, mm -hmm. uh, but what was said uh, yesterday and today, uh, you know, uh, is not new. Uh, in any sense of the term. And the other uh, kind of point that uh, I need uh, kind of uh, to raise, because we've been talking about uh, political uh, factionalism, and your first guest uh, uh, accurately said that actually when it comes to uh, kind of re regime survival, uh, both uh, the conservatives and reformists have uh, a lot in common. And actually what happened a month ago uh, was very important and uh, kind of telling uh, at the same time, which could kind of make us understand what is happening uh, right now and the level of tension and the level of uh, vulnerability uh, that uh, the regime facing. About a month ago, there was a, a kind of there was an earthquake uh, in in Kerman Shah. And in the matter of a few hours, we saw this kind of incredible national mobilization. People okay. were kind of mobilizing and organizing in order to respond to the problem because they thought there is very little trust exists between government and the civil society. Okay. So effectively, they gave up. They gave up on kind of uh, state institutions in order to kind of address, uh, address the problem. And they chose celebrities like footballers as the people who could be kind of the bridge between what they contribute, what they donate, and those people who have been affected I see your point. in, in Kerman's job. Mr. Nadiri, the reason why I'm asking the question about the uh, uh, people uh, being very critical of the uh, uh, foreign intervention is that it's an intervention that comes at a huge price because you need to spend money to maintain regimes in Syria, in Yemen, and also uh, in different parts of, of, of the region. And people basically have been using slogan anti-establishment, anti-Rouhani, and also anti-Ayatollah Khamenei. So how, how, how serious is this discontent taken uh, by, the, by the establishment? Let's not carry, get carried away with, with the politicization of the situation. There will always be some people who will try to take advantage of the situation to politicize matters. And, and I'm afraid they have been successful in doing that for the past two days or so. We have similar protests taking place across the, across the globe when things get tough in economy, when people cannot make ends meet. But the only difference there and here is that they don't politicize matters. Here they are trying to politicize these kind of things. And, and, and I'm afraid that I think uh, I have to make it absolutely clear clear that Iran has every right to protect and, pr and support its allies in the region for the simple fact that if we don't defeat uh, Daesh and Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups in places like Syria, Yemen and Iraq, the, we, we, will have to be, we will have to fight them here in the capital. We, will, we, we have to fight them here because they will be here. So it, 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 pays, when you, it pays off when you spend money on your own national security. Th those who are trying to to question the presence of Iran in these countries don't have any idea what terrorist groups like Daesh could do to Iran. Okay. So Iran okay. has every right to send them weapons and spend money in order to protect itself and its own borders here. U.S. President Donald Trump has long been critical of Iran's government. He says the world is watching how Iran responds to the demonstrations. In a tweet, he said there are many reports of peaceful protests by Iranian citizens fed up with the regime's corruption and its squandering of the nation's wealth to fund terrorism abroad. He added that the Iranian government should respect their people's rights, including the right to express themselves. Mr. Fethullah Najad, you've, you've heard the statement from President Trump, and we know that Trump is yet to certify by mid-January if Iran is complying with, uh, with the nuclear deal. You know that... The, the American position itself has created many problems for the, for the in, international investors and also for the Iranian economy because no one is excited about going now to Iran to invest. To what extent the American factor has been very critical in destabilizing and undermining the Iranian economy? Uh, let me first uh, say a few, uh, one thing about uh, the combination of international and domestic slogans that were chanted throughout the protests. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a lot of Iranians are more critical uh, of the version that uh, Tehran presents when it comes to foreign intervention, particularly in Syria when it, when it comes to supporting the Assad regime. And I think uh, what Iran is doing in Syria is far beyond fighting terrorism, and it's actually supporting uh, a dictatorship. 
And I think a lot of Iranians do understand that, and they don't uh, want to see so much bloodshed also from the Iranian side, you know, so much money, billions of uh, dollars being spent on those adventures. Uh, on what uh, President Trump has tweeted is a disservice to the Iranian people. And, uh, you know, I mean, Mr. Trump is uh, certainly not a torchbearer of democracy uh, by any account. And uh, any kind of, you know, uh, so-called uh, support for the, you know, Iranian citizens' uh, rights of protest is sheer hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the decertification, uh, or the, the certif decertification that is probably going to happen by mid-January, uh, this will perhaps be accompanied by the end of sanctions relief from the US side. Mm -hmm. So, and this would put the entire nuclear deal on the verge of survival, on the verge of collapse. Mm -hmm. Um, so we will see if we're going to see a lot of, of economic sanctions. But when it comes to the economic problems of Iran, uh, the ball, uh, so we have also to look at the government's okay. uh, economic policy. The reason why I'm asking the question about the American factor, Mr. Shahi, is basically the Iranian government saying that we have fulfilled our commitments when it comes to the 2015 nuclear deal. However, the Americans are backstabbing us by threatening to decertify, by putting more pressure on the international donors and investors to come along and invest in Iran. To what, to what extent this is very accurate statement by the Iranian government? Uh, I mean, this is completely a, a different uh, issue, but what is uh, important that we need to kind of uh, uh, bear in mind that uh, over the last year or so, uh, Mr. Trump uh, single-handedly has contributed immensely to the sense and the new wave of uh, anti-Americanism among uh, various segments of uh, Iranian civil society. And one of the main factors behind this new sense of uh, anti-Americanism anti is basically Trump's ideological approach to basically uh, one, uh, one plus five. And of course, there are definitely some shortcomings when it comes to economic policies and economic development by the government of uh, Mr. Rouhani. But at the same time, we should not completely ignore the international uh, dimension. Over the last two years, the government desperately has been trying to uh, kind of invite more uh, international uh, investors. When it comes to kind of the energy sector, they had a degree uh, of uh, success. But given current American kind of antagonism uh, towards Iran and given what is happening right now uh, in, in Washington, Iran has not become a very kind of attractive uh, destination or spot for international uh, investment. So, of course, we have to scrutinize uh, kind of the current okay. policies of the government when it comes to economic development, but this international dimension and the Trump factor is equally uh, important to let okay. us basically have a better understanding of the current economic and, impediments. And how things will evolve. Mr. Nadiri, I mean, over the last 48 hours, we've seen many people basically drawing some parallels between these protests and the 2009 Green Movement. To what extent this is really true? I think th 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 this is overblown, exaggerated. Let's not get carried away. People have every right to demonstrate and, and ask uh, you know, for some answers from the government, and the government is responsible to, 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 to act on them and fix and, and, and meet their, their legitimate demands, you know, like creating jobs, keeping prices down, and, and, and avoiding this kind of infl inflationary, you know, uh, things that are happening in our economy. But at the end of the day, these are just small, pe small groups of people are, that are protesting. At the same time, some people are also tr are trying to politicize this kind of uh, okay. th th this kind of situation. But it has nothing to do with the uh, 2009 post-election unrest, and everything to do with people's legitimate demands to have a, you know, a simple life that they can go and work and make money and make ends meet. That is not illegal. The government should stop arresting these people. Okay. The government should stop blaming others. The government should start acting on, 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 on what people are wanting, which is, you know, I see your uh, point. having a good life, a, good, uh, a living standard. Okay. Uh, you want to say something? In terms of the comparison to the Green Movement. In, le in less than 20 seconds, please. Uh, so the, the Green Movement's failure was not least because of the fact that they did not address the social question. And now the social question is out there on the streets, and it remains to be seen if it can be organized. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ali Fathullah Najant, Gambar Nadiri, and Afshin Shahi. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. 
You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Ahlbal, and the whole team here. Bye for now.